Hello everyone and welcome to your 20th lecture here at uh, Del Mar College. This is Dr. Hurt and we're going to be talking today about life in the Paleozoic. So we did geology of the Paleozoic last time. Now we're going to talk about evolution and life. So um, actually I'm going to kind of start off today. Um, I had to kind of take some slides here from our evolution lecture that we didn't cover because I just need to talk a little bit it's like a little bit of introduction to that stuff because you know uh, it's gonna be kind of rough if we go into this without any background so uh, bear with me a little bit I'm gonna kind of go through this first stuff just kind of introduce you to uh, kind of the diversity of life and then we'll go into life in the Paleozoic okay so I'm gonna fly through this stuff as fast as I can so um so this is again the background some background information that I had cut from the evolution lecture number 13 so you know uh, we classify different species into a you know we categories categorize all of them into a um, system and it's a hierarchical system so every single species you know we give it a um, we give it a species name and a genus right so for example we people are homo sapiens right so we're hominid the genus is hominid and sapien is the species right so uh, every organism is given a genus and species and they're organized somehow into a seven tier hierarchy so you've probably heard of this hierarchy before um, starts off here that everything uh, is categor categorized into one of the six kingdoms of life so there are six kingdoms um, i'm going to show you what those kingdoms are in a second and every kingdom is subdivided into different phyla uh, phyla is plural of phylum okay so uh, every every kingdom is subdivided into phyla and every phyla is subdivided into different classes and then every class is subdivided into orders and every order is subdivided into families every family into genus and every genus into species okay so it's like a big branching tree of life right with kingdoms being that kind of thickest trunk of the branch so there's seven layers to that um, hierarchical system um, this first layer is or first level or is you know the kingdoms of life so you should know these kingdoms of life there are six of them bacteria and archaea are the most basic forms of life so life started off actually as archaea uh, bacteria kind of evolved from back uh, from archaea and gave way to protists which are protozoans which are um, eukaryotic eukaryotic single-celled creatures and from protists came plants fungus and animals okay so that's those are the six kingdoms right bacteria archaea protists plants fungus and animals now probably you all know what plants fungus and animals are fungus is like mushrooms right uh, protists is probably a little bit vague for you all bacteria and archaea i think you have a good enough understanding of they are prokaryotic single-celled creatures right so there's a bacteria right you, so you all know what these things look like they're single-celled microscopic organisms um, the difference between archaea and bacteria you don't need to know in this class um, it's very i mean honestly i don't even know it very well it's something a microbiologist would really be familiar with um, so you just need to know that archaea is kind of a simpler form of bacteria and it's more ancient compared to bacteria so archaea was probably the first sort of organism that existed on earth and uh, eukaryotes originated actually probably from archaea not bacteria although bacteria did uh, did come after archaea so um, let's talk about these different different kingdoms we have so uh, those are the these are the prokaryotes right bacteria and archaea the eukaryotes are, are plants protozoans false uh, animals and fungus now eukaryotes are different than prokaryotes right so prokaryotes are are cells that lack a nucleus and they have a simpler structure with simpler organ uh, organelles so you know all these you know this isn't a this isn't a uh, biology class so i'm not going to go into what each of these organelles do but they're you know suffice to say that cells contain different organelles which are like the organs in our body you know our heart lungs liver they perform certain functions for the cell and uh, eukaryotes you can see are much more complicated than prokaryotes and they also most importantly contain a nucleus where the dna is 
housed. Okay, so um, these are the eukaryotic kingdoms, plants, protists, fungus, and animals. These are the prokaryotic uh, kingdoms, bacteria, and archaea. I want to just touch a little bit on protozoans because protozoans, you're probably like, what the heck is a protozoan? Uh, protozoans are basically single-celled eukaryotic organisms, okay? So single cell, that means they, they're, the whole organism is just one cell. Um, they consist of things like paramecium. Uh, uh, let's see, what are some other things you might have heard of? Amoeba, right? Um, you know, all these other things. You don't need to know all these different types, but you just need to know that paramecia, or sorry, uh, protozoans are single-celled eukaryotic or organisms, okay? Um, algae also is a type of protozoan, okay? So uh, plants, I just want to get a little bit into plants because we're going to be talking a, a, quite a bit about plants today. So um, we subdivide plants into like four basic categories. There are mosses and liverworts, which are the most basic, primary, fundamental kind of plant, okay? So the first plants on earth were things like mosses. The thing about mosses is that they have no vascular system. Okay, you should know that, so you might want to take notes on this part of the lecture here. These have no vascular system. Ferns came after mosses. They have a vascular system, but no seeds. Okay, vascular, no seeds. They have spores instead. Gymnosperms came after vascular plants. They are vascular and have seeds, but they have no flowers and fruit. Angiosperms came after gymnosperms. Gymnos uh, angiosperms are vascular. They have seeds and they have fruit and flowers. Okay? So that's the kind of main four categories of plants, all right? And we're gonna talk about how those evolved specifically today. So plants are just multicellular, eukaryotic, and photosynthetic organisms that, um, oh, so let me erase some of this. So, whoops, whoa, go back. Here we go. Um, so yeah, again, mosses and liverworts have no vascular system. They're most basic. The first plants were these kinds of plants, no, no uh, vascular system. Ferns have a vascular system, but they have no seeds. Gymnosperms have seeds, and angiosperms have flowers and fruits, okay? So this is kind of, this is a really good slide. Um, you should take a look at this one. It's, it's just a really good study tool. Um, I'm not gonna go over everything here, but um, just to kind of give you some idea about the diversity of life. Uh, Non-vascular plants, we, we classify them as either mosses, hornworts or liverworts, vascular plants can be um, club mosses, horsetails, and ferns. Seed producing plants uh, like gymnosperms are either gonna be conifers such as pine trees, cycads, which um, you probably have seen things like cycads, people plant them a lot around here in Corpus Christi. Uh, they look all, all the way, you know, for all the world, they look like a palm, but they're not actually palm. They're not related to palms at all. So they're things like, have you ever heard of royal palm or sago palms? Those, that's the kind of palms they are. They look like this. And then there's ginkgos. Those are all types of gymnosperms. Flowering plants, angiosperms, consist of everything from grasses, cactus, um, you know, flowering trees, fruit trees. Anything with a flower and a fruit is an angiosperm. Okay, so that's just a real quick breakdown of plants. Uh, fungus, I wanted to point out that fungus are actually more closely related to animals than plants. They actually came quite late in the game. Um, fungus is actually the last kingdom to evolve. So fun, funnily enough, you know, fungus almost looks like it should, should have been uh, one of the first organisms to, to uh, exist, but actually it's not. Um, animals, let's go over kind of a breakdown and diversity of animals. So animals are eukaryotic organisms, uh, multicellular, that are capable of movement. Okay, so anything that is capable of movement, eukaryotic, multicellular, we classify that as an animal. So there's some things that you might kind of think of are not really animals. Um, an example for, you know, is uh, the periphera phylum. So like I said, every kingdom is split up into phyla. There are 10 animal phyla. 
So that means that every animal is belongs to one of these 10 phyla, okay? The first and most basic phylum of animals is porifera, okay? So porifera are basically your sponges. Now you've probably heard of sponges before. They are kind of like, maybe you think of them like a coral reef. They are not corals. Sponges are not corals, they're different. We're gonna talk about the differences today. Corals are actually part of this phylum called Nidaria. The sea is silent, okay? So this is Nidaria. Um, you don't need to worry too much about this phylum. This is Platy hematans. Uh, they're flatworms, okay? These are things like flatworms. Nidaria are things like corals. Um, nematodes are roundworms. You don't need to worry too much about those. We don't talk about them much in this class. Mollusca, though, is a really big deal. There's a lot of mollusca in the world. Mollusca are things like uh, shellfish, right? So maybe uh, think oysters, clams, scallops, uh, other creatures like um, octopus and squid are also part of mollusca. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any big ones I'm missing here. Uh, I think that's I think that's sufficient. Annelids, annelida are um, like earthworms. These are segmented worms. And arthropoda, you might know arthropoda, uh, arthropods. These are all insects, anything with segmented joints. So uh, insects, you know, uh, spiders, crabs, crustaceans, all those things are arthropod, arthropods, okay? Um, very, very common. Uh, phylum now, you know, most, in fact, probably, it's probably the most common phylum in the world, uh, at least for animals, okay? Um, echinoderms, echinodermata are uh, starfish, uh, brittle stars, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, some marine organisms, um, other things called crinoids, we'll talk about those later. And then final one is R phylum, Chordata. Chordata is anything with a neural cord, okay, a notochord. So that is, you know, like, like our spinal cord. So these are basically, um, consist of also the vertebrates, okay? So all the vertebrate animals are in the phylum Chordata, okay? So you'll notice all this other stuff, these are all invertebrates. Okay, so those are all invertebrate um, species. That means they have no spinal cord, they have no, no vertebrae, okay? So anyway, those are all the different ones. Um, again, sponges were the first to evolve. And then from sponges, you have uh, the development of tissues. Okay, so sponges have no true tissues. Okay, tissues are special, um, special. They're basically, they're parts of your body, you know, flesh, muscle that do a specific task, do a specific job. So uh, sponges do not have tissues. Nidaria do have tissues, so corals have tissues, sponges have no tissues. Um, the the uh, advent of bilateral symmetry brought about the flatworms, the platyhematins. Um, body cavities brought about uh, roundworms, okay? Um, having a coelom, which is, which is, actually I'm not sure what the difference between a coelom and a body cavity is, I'd have to look that up. But that brought about, you know, what, the mollusks, having segmentation brought about annelids and arthropods, and um, having a, a deuterostome brought about chordates and a kind of dermata. So anyway, you don't need to know all of those little factoids, but I do want you to understand that these are the main 10 phyla of the animal kingdom, okay? So there you go, that's a sponge, that's porifera. Um, now these are actually not, a, this is not a single organism. These, these consist of many different, what are called zooids. They are little organisms that build up this coral structure. Um, so this whole thing is kind of, you can almost think of it as like a big apartment complex. And if you were to zoom in on this, you would see all these little pores, all these little holes. Each hole is filled with a little animal, okay? So it's a colonial animal. That's what builds these structures. Uh, corals are also, Nidaria are also, a lot of them are um, colonial animals. So these corals are colonial, right? These different kinds of coral are all Nidaria, colonial animals. Sea and enemy are, um, are Nidaria. And also uh, your friend, this, the, uh, what are those things called? Jellyfish. 
those are also Nidaria, okay? Platy hematents are flatworms. Um, they're not very common today. I don't talk about them that much, but mollusks we talk about a lot. They consist of snails, gas, what are called gastropods, bivalves, which include things like clams and oysters, and cephalopods, which consists of things like octopus and squids. And also this group of animals, which was very common in the Paleozoic, which we're talking about today, uh, called brachiopods, but they are still around, but not as common. Earthworms are segmented worms. They are, of course, quite common. Uh, I don't talk about them too much, though, in this class. Arthropods, however, are a very big deal. They consist of crustaceans, insects, you know, scorpions, spiders, millipedes, centipedes. These uh, horseshoe crabs are also all arthropods. It's anything with a segmented body and segmented jointed limbs, okay? Um, echinoderms are um, animals that have a uh, deuterostome, including chordates also have a deuterostome. So uh, these are things like sea urchins, starfish, uh, brittle stars, uh, sand dollars, those are all uh, types of echinoderms. One thing you'll notice about echinoderms, they all have a five-fold star symmetry. Okay, you see how there's a star-like symmetry there? If you were to zoom in on this sea urchin, you'd see a five-fold star-like symmetry. You can see the five-fold symmetry there, five-fold symmetry right there in the in the um, sea star. And you can even see this in the whatever that part of the mouth or anus, I'm not sure what that is, of the sea cucumber you can see that five-fold symmetry right there as well. Okay, so chordates, um, I don't really need to talk too much about chordates, but just to kind of give you an idea about some of the diversity of chordates, you have things like lancets, which are the most primary basic types of chordates. Uh, they possess a notochord, but they actually don't have a vertebrae, okay? There are things called sea squirts, which are a little bit strange. You, you probably, you look at that and you think, what's the difference between that and a sponge? But they're actually very different. Uh, uh, sea squirts like this are actually quite advanced can, compared to a sponge, and they do have a notochord, believe it or not, and they actually have a basic respiratory system, which is very unique. Uh, then you have, of course, things like fishes, such as the hagfish, which has a cranium. Um, you get the sharks and ray, the cartilaginous fishes. They have vertebrates and jaws. Uh, then you start to get the um, bonies, bo uh, sorry, uh, ray finned fish and bony fish, which have a miner mineralized skeleton. And then you get tetrapods with four limbs, uh, amni you know, reptiles, which have an amniotic egg, and uh, birds and mammals. You know, mammals are different because, or unique because they produce milk. So uh, anyway, these are all just the kind of, I'm just trying to, I know there's like a, a lot of different stuff, a whirlwind of stuff, but I'm just trying to give you a very quick overview of the diversity of life so that when we get into all of the diversity that originated in the Paleozoic, you're not, it's not confusing for you. So anyway, um, over Earth's history, there's been many mass extinctions in which, of course, a lot of animals, uh, plants went extinct at a given time. Sometimes 90 99% of the species went extinct. So right now, um, there are on Earth tens of millions of uh, probably around 10 million, if not more, species alive right now, okay? In the fossil record, we have only identified 250,000 species. So definitely there have been millions and millions and millions, if not billions of different species, if not trillions of different species over Earth's history. But we only know about 250,000 of them. So we see very little of Earth's total biodiversity, okay? So we only really know a little bit about what the, what life was like in the past. Um, you know, right now, 99, over 99% of the species that have ever lived are extinct now. So we only see a very small portion of the total amount of diversity of life that has existed. Uh, so there are extinctions, mass extinctions from time to time that wipe out maybe 95% of the species on Earth. Um, so the Permian Triassic, that's what we're gonna end with today. We're gonna talk and end this lecture today with the Permian Triassic mass extinction, okay? Um, 
But anyway, these mass extinctions happen naturally from time to time, and uh, they are actually what form the borders of the different geologic ages. So as we move from geologic age to geologic age today, you're going to see that each one ends with a little mass extinction. Okay, So that's kind of the whirlwind tour of uh, the diversity of life. Now I'm going to get on to actual Paleozoic uh, life history. Okay, So we begin our story of the Paleozoic with the Burgess Shale. The Burgess Shale was a or is a very common outcrop, very famous outcrop in Canada. Um, it is Cambrian black marine shale. It represents kind of a deep marine um, environment. It was discovered in 1909 and it has excellent preservation of soft bodied marine animals. So we get a really nice picture of what the um, ocean bottom would have looked like in the Cambrian. Okay, the Cambrian again is the first period of the Paleozoic. So uh, the Burgess Shale is here in Canada, but we find things that are like the Burgess Shale all over the world in Utah, right in Greenland, and in, in in Europe, Spain, right uh, in whatever that is, whatever Baltic country that is, uh, in China. Okay, all over the world, China, you know, Australia, Russia, we find these Burgess-like shale deposits all over. And what do we find in the Cambrian? You know, remember, remember where we're coming from, right? We we just got done talking about like the Ediacaran last week. So remember the Ediacaran, the, the end of the Paleozoic, or sorry, end of the Proterozoic. We really had uh, no familiar species of animals to speak of. You know, we, we had the Ediacaran fauna. It's rare. It's difficult to find. It's it's not very abundant. Um, and they are, there are a few species represented in the Ediacaran fauna, and we cannot really classify them and fit them into the larger picture of the diversity of life today. Okay, we don't know what phyla they belong to. We don't even know if they're animals or what they are. So, that can't be said for the Burgess Shale and the Cambrian fauna. We can fit all of these fossils in fairly well into our pre-existing order and categorization of different animals in the uh, kingdom of, of uh, animal, animalia, right? So um, the first example of this is uh, we, we have early sponges, right, which are a type of periphera. The phylum is periphera. Uh, we have um, uh, Arthropods, okay, you can see these, the, you can see the segmentation here, which is obviously makes it an arthropod. Remember, arthropods have segmented bodies, okay. Uh, so this is what that creature would have looked like, Sidenia in expectans. Um, we have, of course, famous uh, trilobites. These are types of arthropods. Again, you can see these uh, segmented bodies. Um, this is a uh, really kind of a, a strange one. This. Uh, uh, Anomalcaris canadensis, um, the, you know, anomalo anom, is coming from anomalous, right? Uh, canadensis coming from obviously from Canada, um, but this is what this we think this creature might have looked like, um, and you can we think that perhaps it is a um, arthropod due to the segmentation of its body, but it's a little bit like I said anomalous, it's, which means a little bit uncertain exactly what it is and how it fits in. Uh, we have brachiopods, right, which are like mollusks. They're like, uh, you know, shelled organisms, okay? So there's uh, one type of brachiopod. They would look like this, okay? They have their filter feeders, just like modern-day clams. And we still have brachiopods around to, the, to this day, okay? That they are actually distinct from clams. I know that you look at, you're looking at this, you might think, oh, that's just a clam. Uh, they are actually distinct from clams. Okay, so more uh, mollusca. We have uh, Wiwaxia, um, Hallucigenia. Uh, these are these are types of mollusks, actually. Um, we also have annelids, annelida, which are segmented worms. Okay, so earthworms, for example, are segmented worms. These are clearly you can see they're worms, but they're clearly segmented as well. Okay, uh, and we have also chordates. So we have the first chordata, the first uh, animals with a neural cord. You can clearly see in this uh, Pikea grass, grasslands 
um, this neural cord that runs down the animal. Okay, so anyway, we think that it must have looked something like this, very similar to the lancet animals that we have today. Um, Nidaria. We also had Nidaria, which are types of corals, and we had crinoids as well, which are related to sea lilies, which are, represent echinodermata. So my main point is, um, these are sea lilies, by the way. This is what probably you've never seen a sea lily before. I know they look like kind of strange flowers. Uh, they're actually not flowers. They are animals, and they're filter feeders. They use these feathery-like projections that look like petals to um, filter the water and collect little, you know, bacteria and microorganisms to eat. Okay, so those are sea lilies, which are um, Another name for those are crinoids, and they are in the phylum Echinodermata. Here's your Nidaria, which is a type of, you know, the phylum is Nidaria. It is an animal. It is a coral, okay? So my main point here going through all this stuff is that every phylum of animal is suddenly represented in the Cambrian. So we go from the Ediacaran fauna, which is, again, very mysterious. We don't really know how to classify the species we find in the Proterozoic, Adiacran fauna. And then we go to the Cambrian, and all of a sudden, huge changes take place. And we recognize uh, there's a, a great abundance of life, a tremendous abundance of life, a tremendous diversity of life, and a tremendous, um, uh, a, a, you know, also we're able to recognize and categorize these. Uh, according to our current classification system, all of these phyla still exist. We can, we can classify them and recognize the different phyla here. And all the major phyla are represented in the Cambrian Burgess Shale. Uh, there are some strange creatures. We don't exactly know how to fit them in. This is uh, Odontogryphus and uh, Nectocaris. We don't know what phyla they belong to. Um, these are some artist's conceptions of what they might these creatures might have looked like. Again, not sure how they fit in. So uh, this represents, this pie chart represents the relative abundance of species in the Burgess Shale. Uh, you know, we find 33% are arthropods, like trilobites. 22% uh, are porifera, which are types of sponges. A lot of it is just algae, which are, which are again, protozoans. Um, they're not animals at all. They're protozoans in this case. Um, we find Annelida, which are segmented worms. Brachiopoda, which are kind of like clams, right? Um, hemichordata, mollusca. So you can see that the wide, the wide uh, majority of things is really just taken from two pieces of this pie, arthropods, arthropods and porifera sponges, okay? So sponges were obviously very rich in abundance during the um, Cambrian. Now, what's kind of cool is that this is what we actually see, okay? Now, um, like I say, the Burgess Shale is very unique because it preserved soft parts, so it preserved fleshy, meaty parts. So whatever happened in the Burgess Shale, um, that material got buried very fast. So it didn't have time to decompose. The meat and flesh and eyeballs and everything didn't have time to decompose, it got buried very fast before decomposition and scavenging could destroy the fossil. Um, so, so um, that's very unusual. Okay, usually soft parts of animals are not preserved in the fossil record. So it's just kind of interesting because this is what we actually see in the actual distribution of different phyla, different um, animals in the Burgess Shale. If it were the case that only hard parts were preserved, which is more normal for a fossil, uh, you know, a, a fossil quarrying site. This is what it would look like. We would have an overrepresentation of arthropods, and uh, you know, we there's a lot of things we wouldn't really have captured and seen. So we'd get a very big, we'd get a very twisted idea of what the Burgess Shale. Uh, seafloor might have actually looked like if we didn't get that beautiful preservation of soft parts, okay? So remember that hard parts of creatures, so you know, you take this um, belemite, for example, it's kind of a squid-like creature with a shell. Usually the soft, meaty material uh, gets rotted away, just leaves the shell, the shell gets buried and preserved, and that becomes the fossil. 
However, uh, the burgess was not like that. That soft, meaty material was also preserved, okay? So the burgess shale is so beautiful because it preserved a lot of those soft bodies. So we get a very full picture of what the ecosystem was like at the time. If we didn't have the soft bodied materials, this is the difference, okay? This is what we think the Burgess Shale um, environment actually looked like at the time. If we did not have soft bodies, this is what we would think it looks like. So you can see that this is vibrant, full of life. It's like this vibrant, you know, sponge, coral reef. And if we didn't have that, you know, this is what we would think it looked like. And it just looks like kind of dead, you know. So anyway, uh, it's great to have those soft parts. So, you know, think about this. This is a big, big deal. It's a big, big deal for, you know, thinking about life and where life came from. Uh, a big deal for, I mean, just the, you know, big questions of life, you know, where humans fit into existence and where we have come from, where animals come from, where earth has come from, all these questions are touched on in a very unique way by this, what's called the Cambrian explosion. So think about this, think about this. The Proterozoic 600 million years ago, we have the Ediacaran fauna, few specimens, very rare, difficult to classify. Okay, we have maybe the very beginnings of animals in the Ediacaran. 542 million years later, sorry, 542 million years ago, in a period of 10 million years, the number of animals explodes. The diversity of life explodes. Every extant phylum of animal is suddenly present, okay? This is known as the Cambrian explosion. So this is when all of a sudden, animal life just becomes abundant in the, in the fossil record. Nobody knows why. We have ideas hypotheses, but nobody really has a clear answer as to why. Okay, so you can see this is showing biodiversity through time. Okay, so this this red line you see here, this is the Cambrian. So on this side is the Proterozoic, you know, um, Proterozoic. On this side is the Cambrian, okay. All these kind of Ignore these little dot dashed lines. We don't really know. They're nothing. We don't we don't really know what any of that stuff is. It's just an idea. It's a hypothesis. So all of a sudden, you see all of these important groups of animals come into existence right at the Cambrian, 542 million years ago. Okay. So it's a mystery. What does it all mean? Where does it come from? Why did this happen? Uh, it's still a mystery to this day. These are very useful uh, graphs. I want to show this to you. Um, this is the number of marine animals, marine families of animals. This is time on the on the horizontal scale. So you can see um, this is really giving you a picture of what biodiversity was doing over Earth's history. You can see that uh, this represents, the V represents the um, Vendian, which is another term for the late Proterozoic. Um, so this is the Proterozoic right here. You can see all of a sudden there's this explosion in biodiversity. And we mark that 542 million years ago, we mark that as the beginning of the Cambrian, the beginning of the Paleozoic, and the beginning of a new eon, the Phanerozoic, right? So um, you can see that every time you see a big dip here, and a resurgence, that is a uh, mass extinction, okay? So every time you see a dip, like right here, you see this dip, uh, a trough, we could call it, in the biodiversity, that represents a, um, a mass extinction. So you can see that um, we have the beginning of the Cambrian, we can see that all of a sudden there's a little dip, a little trough, and then we have another explosion of biodiversity in the Ordovician. There's a trough at the end of the Ordovician. Then we have a new um, new age, the Silurian. There's a little trough at the end of the Silurian that gives us the Devonian. 
a little trough at the end of the Devonian, right? If we trace this down, we can see that it matches with the end of the Devonian. We get the uh, Carboniferous, okay? Um, the between the Pennsylvanian and Mississippian right there, between the Carboniferous and the Permian. And then there is the huge whoomp. You see how much it shoots down. That's the PT Permian Triassic mass extinction 250 million years ago, okay? That's the end of the that's the that's the end of the Paleozoic. So this is the Paleozoic contained for you right here. Okay. So how many how how could so many going back to the Cambrian explosion? How could so many species appear so suddenly? Only ten million years. This at the time uh, Darwin was very concerned about this uh, theory because or this fact I should say because uh, it seemed like a challenge to his theory of evolution. Um, below, uh, oh, this is, I found this is a pretty interesting talk. Uh, you know, this is still, still an issue today. Um, I'm not going to show this YouTube video, but this is a really interesting talk, you know, people discussing how, um, the Cambrian explosion still to this day, it's very difficult to understand it in the context of Darwin's, uh, theory of evolution by natural selection. Not saying that the theory is wrong, but I think it, it's saying, I think more and more scientists are starting to realize that there's another piece of the puzzle here that we have to look for. So anyway, this is a very interesting talk and uh, it, it presents the research of four scientists, four um, evolutionary biologists who are exploring these uh, issues. So Darwin said it himself, consequently, if my theory be true, it is indisputable that before the lowest Silurian stratum was deposited. So uh, long periods elapsed probably far longer than the whole interval from the Silurian age to the present day and that the during these vast yet quite unknown periods of time the world swarmed with living creatures to the question why we do not find records of these vast primordial periods I can give no satisfactory answer so this was Darwin addressing why we do not find any fossils of animals in uh, before I should say before the uh, Cambrian so uh, it was something he recognized at the time as, as uh, a problem and he tried to answer it. So just some possible hypotheses about, again, we don't really know, but hypotheses about why the Cambrian explosion happened. Um, one is possibly there was unequal preservation. So it could have been that there were a lot of different animals that were around in the Proterozoic but that um, they didn't have hard parts. They were very fleshy and soft, and they just didn't get preserved very well. So that's, that's one, that's one uh, hypothesis. Another hypothesis is that um, the advent of predation among animals uh, led to rapid evolution. Okay, so uh, maybe predation is just a very effective means of achieving evolution by natural selection. Another hypothesis, uh, uh, hypothesis is that perhaps oxygen, you know, finally became very prevalent. You'll notice around the um, around the Paleozoic. So perhaps it was the advent of abundant oxygen that spurred biodiversity. We we don't really know. And you know what? There's even here are even more. There are even more um, different uh, explanations. So you know, I, I just put this. You don't have to know all this stuff, but you could read uh, if you're interested in this topic. This is a kind of a good poster that shows all these sorts of different causes of possible hypotheses that explain the Cambrian explosion. But anyway, uh, there was an explosion in the diversity of life in the Cambrian. And this depicts a scene, a typical scene from the Cambrian benthic community as preserved in the Burgess Shale. Benthic, by the way, this term benthic means bottom of the ocean. Okay, so the ocean floor. So we see a lot of uh, a lot of little creatures here: Wawaxia, uh, Hallucigenia, Wapashia. Uh, we'll, we'll go into some of these different animals and just kind of show you some of these. Uh, uh, Vauxia, which was a type of sponge, a species of sponge in the phylum, of course, of Periphera, were very common. They belonged to the order of Stromatoporides. Stromatoporides were very important reef building sponges. So during the Paleozoic, you're going to see that one thing that we talk about a lot in this class are the different reef building uh, things that are building up 
I'm not going to call them coral reefs because they're not always corals, but things that are building up reefs in the ocean. So that means that they're depositing skeletons and hard parts uh, that attach to the ocean floor and kind of build up the ocean floor. Okay, that's what a reef is. So at this time in the Paleozoic, the most important reef building organism, they were sponges of the order stromatoporides. So this is a fossil stromatoporide. Okay, so these are reef builders, colonial animals, uh, filter feeders. Every little pore that you see here contained a different animal, different, not a different animal, but it's all the same species, but a different individual organism. Okay. So that's how sponges work. You know, inside these little pores, there's these micros, not, maybe not microscopic, but very small little pores that contain all the different zooids. Okay. Porifera, by the way, again, that's the phylum porifera. So it belongs to the sponges, the general characteristics. Periphera means pore bearer because it has these different pores, lots of little pores within the um, within the skeleton system you see there. Um, its body tissue is multicellular, but it has no true tissue. That's what sets it apart from um, from Nidaria. Some sponge skeletons are made up of calcium carbonate, like these ones. These are made out of calcite, but some of them are actually made of a collagen material that's very flexible. Um, that you know very well as the sponge that you would use to bathe with. So when you get a sponge, you know, you can actually go to the store, even HEB, they sell them. They sell natural sponges. And when you get a natural sponge, that's an actual or was an actual organism, you know, an actual porifera sponge that used to live in that. Um, but now the animal's dead, of course, and you're just basically washing your body with its skeletal tissues, okay? So, um, it also contains these spicules, which were needle-shaped structures made of silica, give support to the body and use as a defense mechanism. Okay, so they're asymmetrical um, and live in these any kind of marine environment. Okay, so again, if you zoom in to one of the pores, you could see that there's actually in it a little animal. Okay, that's called a zooid. And so every sponge is just a colony of these little creatures, okay? And they're filter feeders. They're just, they're just using these little feathery um, extensions of their body to filter out the water and collect food. And they're collecting microorganisms, okay? Like bacteria and protozoans to eat. Another type of uh, sponge, it's, well, it's kind of unclear if it was a sponge or a coral, but they're very common in the Paleozoic, was Archaeocyatha. So Archaeocyatha, uh, again, is colonial. It's a reef builder. It's a filter feeder. It's, you know, sucking water into the, um, into the little pores here. And there's a little animal that lives in the pore, sucking out the water and um, using that for food, okay? So, uh, so, uh, Archaeocyatha was a very important species. We find very abundant fossil reefs made uh, of those animals in the Paleozoic. Uh, let's talk a, talk a little bit about Wapashia. Wapashia was an arthropod. You can see it almost looks like a shrimp, right? A shrimp is an arthropod as well. Um, another abundant animal at this time were crinoids, which are types of sea lilies. You see these things a lot, and you especially very common to find in Paleozoic limestones you find pieces of these stems, these segmented stems. It's very, very common to find these. Um, sometimes call those endocrinal uh, limestones when they're just full of these little crinoid stalks, okay? So they look almost like um, little beads or something in, in the um, limestone. So you, well, you can see what they look like right here. So almost like, I, I don't know, to me, they almost remind me of like a string of flat beads or something you find in the limestone, but. Anyway, uh, again, they are filter feeders, just like the corals. Um, they're using those feathery extensions to filter out the water. They're sessile. Sessile means that they just stay in one place on the ocean floor. They belong to the phylum Echinodermata and uh, very common in the Cambrian. Okay, so let me just get rid of these things here. Can see this a little bit more clear. Yeah, so this is what these you this is very common to find limestones that look like this. Let me move this. It's just a little bit annoying here. Here we 
go. Yeah, this is what they look like. So this is a really nicely preserved uh, crinoid, but um, this is very commonly what you find in Paleozoic rocks. Um, in fact, I wouldn't be too surprised if you, you know, you can actually find these pretty easily if you find a Paleozoic limestone deposit. If you're ever riding through, I don't know, North Texas, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, you find these things quite commonly. Um, this is what modern day sea lily crinoids look like today. So you can see that it's kind of strange. You know, they look like, I don't know, like flowers or plants. And probably if you saw this, you would think it's a plant. It's not a plant at all. It is an animal. And actually, it's, um, it's, it might be funny to think this, but these things are more closely related to you than maybe an earthworm or even a spider or something like that is. You know, you might, you might look at, I don't know, an insect and think that surely they're more closely related to us than these things. But these things are actually uh, pretty close relatives of, of us in the sense of they're closely related to the chordates. Um, so uh, anyway, the Cambrian also saw the advent of these creatures that are now extinct called graptolites. You find a lot of graptolites. So this is what graptolites look like. Graptolites were filter feeders as well, but they were planktonic. Planktonic, you probably heard of the term plankton before. Planktonic means um, free floating. So these little guys would float around. They almost look like spiders or something, but they're just using these, again, feather-like appendages to filter out the water. And again, they're just collecting bacteria and little microorganisms in the water and eating it. That's what that's how they live. So they just float through the water and filter feed. Um, however, they went extinct. Um, we don't have any modern day graptolites anymore, but this is what graptolites look like um, in the fossil record. So it's a pretty common, pretty common thing to find. So that's the Cambrian. Um, moving along, now we're just gonna do a little march through the different periods and just kind of big, big events that happened in the different periods of the Paleozoic. Remember, Paleozoic goes Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and the Permian, right? So we're gonna go through these this little bit. Um, you know, we're not gonna spend that much time on each one. Uh, during the Ordovician, there was a major, uh, ex, you know, boost in the biodiversity at the beginning of the Ordovician. You got these squid-like creatures called belemnites. They're very common in the Ordovician. So they belong to Phylum mollusca. The class is cephalopo cephalopods, okay, cephalopoda. So um, that's what they look like. These are fossil belemnites. Again, you have this squid-like animal that lives in a shell, okay? And we do have creatures like this today, by the way. Um, they're called nautiloids. So this is the Ordovician right, right here. You can see that ends with a pretty big mass extinction the end of the Ordovician, okay? Now, uh, in the Cambrian, we had a lot of trilobites, brachiopods, archaeocythads. Those things are gonna kind of die out and we're gonna get um, diversification. And um, actually, I shouldn't say they're gonna die out. They don't die out, but we get diversity. We get more species. So added on to that, we're gonna get, um, for the first time, we're gonna get corals. So we're gonna get nidaria these tabulate corals, that's what they look like. We're gonna get a new type of thing, kind of looks like a coral, but it's not exactly a coral. It's called a bryozoan, okay? And we're gonna get more of these, uh, what are called rugose corals. They're these solitary coral animals. So instead of living in a colony, these corals live just one per, they live in this little horn-shaped shell. Okay, so these are what rugose corals would look like during the Ordovician, okay? So the Ordovician is just full of these. This kind of brain sponge looking thing over here is actually a, um, it's actually one of these tabulate corals, okay? Okay, these are the rugose corals. And uh, here's your belemnite, right? You see a belemnite right there. There's a brachiopod right here. There's a crinoid right there, a sea lily. So that's what all these different species are that you're seeing. Bryozoans are kind of a weird creature. Um, there are still bryozoans around. Here's what it looks like. Um, if, again, they're just colonial filter feeders, much like coral, um, but they are different. They're distinct from coral. So this is what a zoom in on the zooid actually looks like. So again, this thing is just composed of a lot of little, little guys like that, okay? 
So um, actually, you'll find bryozoans um, covering rocks a lot. They almost look like this pretty lace. Um, sometimes I pick up, by the way, you can actually find these if you go and look at um, your seashells or rocks, sometimes barnacles that get washed up on the shore. If you look really closely, I've seen this before on the beaches in Corpus Christi. If you look really closely, you'll see it has this little covering of lace. I call it lace because bryozoan actually means lace animal. But um, this little covering of what looks like lace over the rock or over the shell or over the barnacle, that's a bryozoan. So it's pretty cool that these little guys have these little tiny little animals and they form on other, sometimes the shells of other animals. So again, it's colonial, but they are a little bit more advanced than corals. Okay, so sponges maybe look like corals to you, but they're they're um, a little bit different, okay? And uh, they're more advanced. So here's some of the differences between sponges, corals, and bryozoans. Um, sponges are the simplest kind of animals with no tissues. Nidaria, however, have tissue. They have symmetry to their bodies. Porifera animals are totally asymmetrical, okay? Nidaria also have stingers. So every little zooid in there has a little stinger that it can use to capture its prey. Sea anemones are nidaria. Uh, jellyfish are nidaria. And as you know, both of those things can sting. Um, bryozoans are even more um, advanced. They have a coelom, which is like a body cavity. They have a lophophore, which is a feeding tube. And they also have a separate anus. Uh, I know this sounds kind of gross, but corals and um, porifera sponges, they both basically they poop out of their mouth. Um, I know that's disgusting, but that's how they'd live. So uh, bryozoans, hey, you know, thumbs up to them because they actually have an anus. So that's a good thing. Um, mineralized exoskeletons as well. So that is a uh, actually quite a bit more advanced. Bryozoans are quite a bit more advanced than the rest of these animals. Okay. I know they look the same, but they're actually more advanced. So the Ordovician brought about uh, the Bryozoans, brought about Belemnites, um, you know, brought about corals, uh, tabulate corals and rugose corals, a lot of good stuff. So the Ordovician ended with a mass extinction, perhaps due to the glaciation of Gondwana and sea level drop, we're not exactly sure. But we had a mass extinction here. You can see the great big drop in biodiversity. And we start the next period here, the Silurian, and the Devonian periods. So um, the most, excuse me, common marine fossils from the Silurian and Devonian include some of your old favorites, the tabulate corals, which are nidaria. Okay, that's what your tabulate corals look like. By the way, we have some beautiful tabulate corals like this fossils uh, on, a, on display in our um, kind of display case that we have on the third floor of the Coles building in, the, in front of the geology department if you're ever over there look really good. Um, we have rugose corals, which again are nidaria, phylum nidaria. They are kind of in this shape. It's kind of interesting. Um, the ancient Chinese used to think that these were dragon's teeth they, that they found in the, um, in the sediments and, and in the uh, sedimentary rocks. They used to grind them up. In fact, I think they still do grind them up thinking they're dragon's teeth into a powder that they use for probably aphrodisiacs, if I had to guess. But uh, whatever they use it for, um, it's, it's, uh, it's like a Chinese traditional medicine. Uh, stromatoporides, type of periphera, very common as well in the Silurian and Devonian. Okay? Now added on to those old favorites in the Silurian and Devonian, we start to see um, some of these <clears throat> end up being a very successful species or group of species called the aminoids. Uh, aminoids are like the belemnites, you'll notice that they kind of have this squid-like appearance and they have a shell, but you'll notice that the shell is curled, it spirals around. So that is uh, an aminoid. The aminoid can usually, uh, the way that they work is they can usually um, expel water out of the shell and they can use it to control their buoyancy. So they can actually float or sink, kind of like a submarine. Um, you know, depending on what they want to do. So they're, they're quite capable of swimming. Um, we do have, we don't have extant still living aminoids in this day and age, but um, 
we do have things that are like them called nautiloids, and I think I have a picture of them later. Um, another thing that came along in the Silurian Devonian are these things, sea scorpions. Again, they're these segmented um, arthropod-like creatures, uh, quite formidable looking, and they're very common in the Silurian and Devonian um, uh, sedimentary rock units. They're called Euryptids, okay? Now, one of the huge, huge, huge advances that came about in the Silurian was the advent of fish. So uh, there were jawless chordates in the Cambrian, but the first fish with jaws, so I put, you know, I have jaws here, right? That's what happened in the Silurian is jaws. The first fish with jaws came about in the Silurian. Jaws were a big deal, okay? So I can't, Icanthodian was a the, one of the first fishes with a jaw, and again, it's it's a big deal because a jaw was ended up being a very. I mean, you see how it is now. I mean, fish to this day still have jaws because it's a very effective design. It's very effective for catching food. Um, so jaws. Uh, eventually, jawed fish is they were the um, animals that eventually led to uh, land animals lobed finned fish and you know our earliest ancestors right uh started you know so this traces our lineage all the way back to jawed fish so jawed fish were a big deal that came around in the silurian so the first jawed fish were these um animals you've probably seen these things before placoderms they had these uh platy bony um teeth like uh, structures help them to catch their prey um of course these things went extinct you can see at the end of the Devonian. Um, <clears throat> we also had yeah, uh, chondrichth gosh, chondrich chondrith can barely even say this. I don't I don't ever use this word. Basically it's the um, cartilaginous fish. So these are things like rays and sharks. Okay. So uh, rays like stingrays, for instance, sharks, skates, things like that are all in the same family, um, chondrichthysis maybe. Uh, it's in this, it's in this uh, class of cartilaginous, I call it cartilaginous fish, okay? Now, separate from that are the ray-finned fish, um, osteochythus, okay? Ostea means bony, right? So um, these are the bony fish. So bony fish include things like all the fish that probably you know and love, right? Uh, red, red drum, red fish, you know, speckled trout, salmon, things like that. Those are all ray-finned bony fish, okay? Uh, we also had lobed-finned fish, which are st very, they were very common in the Paleozoic and are still around today. So these are lobed fins. And this actually probably we think gave rise to the first amphibians. You can see how these guys kind of look like they, almost like they have feet, right? Almost like tetrapods. So this was a very important group of animals. Um, the closing of the Iapetus Ocean in the late Devonian brought about the second mass extinction in marine communities. You can see this big mass extinction right here, the end of the Devonian. And this, is, this brought about the Carboniferous. Now, the Carboniferous was a very important time. This is a time when, uh, when we start to get the colonization of the continents by, by animals. So uh, up to this point, life was basically restricted to marine environments okay just ocean environments now in the carboniferous we start to see uh, both plants and animals and other creatures starting to colonize the the um what do you call it um the the continents the land okay so arthropods were the first animals to start living on land the oldest known terrestrial fossil comes actually comes from the Silurian, which is 428 million years ago. This is the oldest terrestrial, that means living on the land, living on the continents, terrestrial creature. And it's a millipede-like animal, Mirapoda, which is not an insect, okay, but it's an arthropod, okay? So the, this was probably one of the first animals to live on land. Um, so we get the first jawed fish here in the Silurian, like I said, some of the first land plants in the Ordovician, but things become very common. Uh, they really start to uh, highly colonize the land starting in the Carboniferous, which is again during the Pennsylvanian and Mississippian. Okay, so we see a lot of these things 
first animals to live on land right here in the Silurian, okay? Um, like I said, land plants start to, again, colonize, uh, colonize the continents. We start off with non-vascular plants. Remember, I talked about this in the very beginning of this lecture. So we have things like mosses and liverworts, hornworts, things that are non-vascular. By the way, I should explain this. Vascular and non-vascular. Vascular means that <clears throat> has a vascular system. It's able to send uh, nutrients, water, food uh, throughout the tissues of the plant. Okay, so that's what makes something vascular. Mosses can't do that. A moss cannot send water into the different parts of its body. So that's why mosses have to grow close to the ground. You know, we don't have any moss trees, right? They don't ever form these large, large organisms. They cover the ground very low to the ground. That's what moss does because it needs to stay close to the ground to soak up the moisture because it has no vascular system to transport food or moisture through its body. Okay, Vascular systems came with ferns and then seeds came later uh, with the first gymnosperms. Okay, So first land plants were things like, this is probably what the first land plants would have looked like. So we find, um, we find fossils we actually find fossilized spores early in the Ordovician. This is what the fossilized spores look like. We actually find these early in the Ordovician, uh, which means that there must have been land plants even in the Ordovician. Okay, so we have early vascular plants maybe appearing about 410 million years ago during the Devonian. So we have in the Ordovician, we have down here, we have maybe the first plants to get onto land. During the Devonian, we get the first vascular plants appearing. So we start to get things like ferns, okay? So vascular systems are very important for colonizing the, um, the continents because if you don't have a vascular system, it's very hard to transport moisture, okay? So you, you have a lot more options and a lot more capabilities if you have a vascular system because it allows you to be in relatively dry climates and conditions. So vascular systems allow, again, water and nutrients to be pumped and transported through the tissues of the plant. Okay, so you can see that um, early vascular systems coming around maybe in the Devonian. So this is probably the oldest uh, actual fossil of a plant. It's called Cooksonia. Probably looked something like this. It is, uh, we find fossil spores and plant materials in the Silurian. So the actual, like, we find, while we do find fossil spores in the Ordovician, we don't find actual plant matter until the Silurian. Okay, so we're absolutely sure, definitely, there were, there were, um, there were uh, plants on land by the Silurian. So the Devonian plants had developed simple leaves they were vascular, they had no seeds, and they reproduced by spores. So now we have things like mosses, ferns, and horsetails. This is what horsetails look like, okay? So maybe this is what plants would have looked like, land plants would have looked like in the Devonian. And as you can see, they're starting to look more tree-like. They can, they're looking more tree-like because they have vascular systems now. So this is possibly what a Devonian forest might have looked like, or a Devonian swamp. Um, by the late Devonian, we see seed-bearing plants. Um, so these are the gymnosperms, okay? Um, very, very successful adaptation. Uh, the, so the first uh, early seed-bearing family were these um, Lysenopterids. Okay, so this is what actual fossils of their seeds. We, uh, we actually have fossils preserved of these seeds, of these um, Lysenopterid uh, species, okay? So you can see this is what they would have looked like. We have nice fossils of their leaves. These are nice diagrams giving you a good idea. And they look almost fern-like, right? And it makes sense that they look fern-like because they evolved from the vascular, uh, the vascular plants and ferns, right? Um, but these are not flowers here. I know they might kind of look like flowers, but they're not, they're not true flowers. But they are producing seeds for the first time. Now, another huge... That, so that's kind of, that, that was kind of like big developments in plant life during 
the Paleozoic. Now I'm going to move on to some big developments in continental uh, continental life during the Paleozoic. So again, the continents, uh, the first animals to invade the continents were probably insects, um, arthropods, but we're really interested in when the first amphibians and things originated on land, right? Because those are our earliest ancestors in our lineage, right? We're, we're, direct, we're ultimately descended, our bodies are ultimately descended as humans from the tetrapods, from amphibians and lobed fin fish. So um, one of the first amphibian-like animals possibly to uh, make it up onto land was this uh, tiktalic. I know there's like a, a weird word, but tiktalic. I think it's actually, if I'm not mistaken, it might be Greenland. It comes from a strange strange um, language, but or strange place. So um, that's why it has kind of a strange word. But um, this tiktalic rosea was a transitional species between fish and amphibian tetrapods. So you can see it has some fish-like um, fish-like and amphibian-like uh, characteristics. So it seems to have something like a limb, but the limb has a fin at the end of it, right? And you can see it kind of has a shape of its skull flattened out, kind of looking like an amphibian, right? Um, so the evolution of terrestrial animals. Before complex animal life could move onto land, it had to evolve uh, to overcome some, some basic problems, okay? So, uh, these were a few of the kind of basic basic problems that needed to be overcome in order for animals to live on land. First problem was gravity. Animals needed a way to support their own weight. Okay, They needed to have a way to support their own weight. Uh, you know, in the water, you're free, free floating. You don't have to feel the effects of gravity. So you need to develop a strong muscular and skeletal system. Desiccation. Uh, that means drying out, right? So you need a way to preserve your moisture of your body. You need, to, you need a way to stop yourself from drying out, okay? Um, another problem is how to get oxygen from the air because remember all of the animals up to this point had gills or they were just um, absorbing air oxygen directly from the water through their, through their bodies by diffusion, okay? So we needed to have respiratory systems. We also needed to have reproduction, okay? Um, eggs were the primary source of reproduction at this time, but eggs easily dry out on land. So how do you get the eggs to stop from drying? Okay, so we'll see that there are different solutions that evolved to these problems of living on land. Um, very interesting discovery that was made actually not too long ago in the Holy Cross Mountains of Poland. We actually find tetrapod tracks. You can see these trace fossils. Tetrapod track, even with toes, look at that. 395 million years ago in the middle Devonian. This is amazing because this was much, it's, it's just crazy because this is much earlier than we find. Um, this is much earlier than wh when we find the actual earliest tetrapod uh, fossil species on land. So it's it's interesting because we don't find the actual body of a, of a, of a terrestrial animal till fairly late in the game. but we know that they must have been on land because look we have the, we have the you know the tetrapod tracks, right? So this was a really huge find. And, and furthermore, you'll notice there's no body dragging, there's no tail dragging. Um, in this. So this animal was able to, and it's a fairly big animal as well. You can see how the size of the tracks, it was able to carry its tail and its body, had the muscular and skeletal structures to lift its body up and, and walk. So it had overcome the gravity problem in a big way, even this early on. So 395 million years ago, you can see that that's right, uh, where it would be right about here, the earliest tetrapod footprints, right? So uh, pretty amazing, you know, they don't, they don't, we don't have the earliest amphibians and earliest tetrapod skeletons until 359, which is the end of the Devonian. Okay, so it's pretty, pretty interesting, I think. So anyway, um, 
Acanthostega was the first tetrapod species, late Devonian, that we actually have uh, remnants of that we're, we're thinking that's, you know, yes, that was a tetrapod um, animal. So uh, it had four limbs, it had toes, it had feet and not fins. It had a little rib cage, supports that, or suggests that it could not support itself outside the water. And it had possibly limbs that helped Acanthostega navigate the dense swampy water. So what we're kind of thinking is that Acanthostega was kind of an amphibian-like, almost like a giant newt. Um, and it used those limbs to kind of walk around and navigate through the logs and debris that might have been in a, in a swamp-like environment, okay? So um, here's Acanthostega coming in at 365 million years ago, okay? Um, you know, we don't get to these, uh, you know, I pointed out that Tiktaalik 375 million years ago. So these are kind of, that's kind of an earlier species. You might remember the Tiktaalik had um, fins instead of toes, right? There you can see the, the fins on the end of its lobes there. So anyway, uh, the earliest known thing that was clearly, after Acanthostega, the earliest known thing that was definitely what we would consider an amphibian was Ichthyostega. Okay, Ichthyostega had a big rib cage, strong limbs, and was surely able to walk on land. You know, it was kind of unclear really, was this guy walking on land, living on land? We, we can't really say, but Ichthyostega was definitely an amphibian, meaning that it went both into the water and uh, onto dry land. Now, uh, from the amphibians came the reptiles. The difference between the amphibian and the reptile is an amniotic egg. The amniotic egg allows an animal to reproduce on land away from the water. All amphibians require water to do reproduction. They lay their eggs in the water because their eggs will dry out if not. Um, the first reptiles were not like that, okay? The first reptiles had an amniotic egg. By the way, you are an amniote, you know, you when you were in the womb gestating as a baby, you were in an amniotic sac. That amniotic sac kept you nice and wet, you know, stopped you from getting dried out when you were in the womb, right? So um, we are amniotic animals. Uh, reptiles are also amniotic, okay? So then we're different from the amphibians in that way. So evolution of the amniotic egg allowed for reproduction apart from the water. So this very first reptile species, um, Archaeothyrus, um, had a lot of things that well adapted it for life on land. It had kind of a scaly skin. It had it stopped it from getting dried out. It had an amniotic egg right? Um, I think I go into more things here. Um, early reptiles like the proto, I got an extra TO here, protothyrids had advanced limbs well suited for rapid movement on land. So um, they, they had a, a body that was a, you know, limbs that were strong enough to keep its body and tail up above this, up above the, uh, from dragging on the um, surface of the land is what I'm trying to say. They had strong jaws, strong teeth, scales, that prevented desiccation and of course an amniotic egg. Okay, so from the Mississippian, you know, Mississippian um, is part of the Carboniferous. We have this little guy, um, Westlothenia, um, which was a early reptile um, of the Paleozoic. Okay, so you can, think, you can see things are moving along very rapidly here. So from these kind of small reptiles, kind of lizard-like creatures, we start to get things that might, you might think, oh, this is a dinosaur. So we're not quite there yet. We're not at dinosaurs yet. We don't have dinosaurs until the Mesozoic. Um, but we do start to get these things called pelicosaurs. So pelicosaurs were huge reptiles. I mean, relatively speaking, these are massive, right? Before we were talking about things that were one or two feet long. Now we're getting really big, massive reptiles, okay? So this was a much larger creature. They had this very characteristic fin on their back that we think might have played a role in perhaps heat regulation. We don't really know what the fin was for, but um, that, that's, a, that's a kind of a leading hypothesis. These were a very important group of animals because believe it or not, um, mammals 
these are actually the ancestors to mammals. So uh, these, these palicosaurs went extinct by the end of the Permian, which is, as you know, the last period of the Paleozoic. And they were replaced by a group of animals known as therapsids. These are mammal-like reptiles, okay? So by the end of the Pennsylvanian and the Permian, palicosaurs were on top of the world. They were really kind of the leading predators, uh, very big, strong, powerful animals. And they were, they were kind of king of the jungle at that time, the late Pennsylvanian and Permian, okay? So prototyrids, which were early reptiles, earliest reptiles, you know, in the, um, well, would it be in the Mississippian and uh, late Devonian, gave way to palicosaurs in the Mississippian and ultimately to therapsids, which are the ancestors of mammals. And you can see how mammal, that's looking a little bit more mammal-like. That almost looks like a cross, right, between maybe a, a dog and a, and, a, and a dinosaur or something like that, right? So um, on the other hand, uh, these theoc uh, theocodontians split off from the prototyrids um, early in, you know, perhaps the Mississippian and became the dinosaurs, okay? So we split off from the dinosaurs. We humans, mammals, split off from the dinosaurs very early on around in the Mississippian, okay? So uh, therapsids are a very important group. Um, I know that I've been talking for an hour, 15 minutes, but remember that if you were in class, we would be going an hour, 20 minutes every day, and I rarely ever do that. So uh, we're almost done. This is almost the very last slide. I'm sorry. It's going on a long time, but uh, the therapsids were a really important group of animals. These uh, were what I said, like I said, gave rise to the mammals. So mammals came from therapsids at the end of the Permian, okay? So um, the, these were types of what are called synapsids. We'll talk about the difference between uh, synapsids and other groups in the next lecture. So um, by the end of the Permian though, therapsids were the dominant group of reptiles. So they were a very powerful group of animals, but they were soon to be kind of overwhelmed by uh, the dinosaurs and kind of took a back seat for a long time, but eventually they won, won out because, you know, in the Cenozoic, the therapsids had evolved into mammals and the mammals uh, obviously are in charge these days. So anyway, um, the Paleozoic closes with the largest mass extinction that has ever occurred in Earth history, the PT, what's called PT mass extinction, which stands for Permian Triassic mass extinction. The cause is still unknown, but we think it may have been caused perhaps by massive volcanism that was going on during this time that uh, drastically changed the climate by, uh, by a methane release. So anyway, uh, that was a huge mass extinction. 96% of, of all marine species went out along with 66% of all terrestrial animals. So it was a huge, huge, huge extinction. And it gave way to the age of the dinosaurs, which is what we're gonna be talking about next time. Thank you for listening. I know it was a very long lecture compared to usual, but I hope you have a good rest of your day and I will talk to you next time. We're gonna talk about geology in the Mesozoic.